The following is a production of the Pritzker Military Library. Welcome to the Pritzker Military Library audio podcast. This week, author Dave Palmer discusses the Revolutionary War in his latest book, George Washington and Benedict Arnold, A Tale of Two Patriots. For more information, visit our website at pritzkermilitarylibrary.org. The Pritzker Military Library. More than a library, it's an experience. They were two giant figures from the American Revolution. The names Washington and Arnold became synonymous with differing virtues. How were these two alike, and what, in the end, made them so different? Author Dave Palmer discusses his new book, George Washington and Benedict Arnold. That's coming up next. From Chicago, Illinois, this is Tonight at the Pritzker Military Library. George Washington and Benedict Arnold, A Tale of Two Patriots. Featuring our special guest, Dave Palmer. And now from the McHenry Atrium of the Pritzker Military Library, your host, Ryan Yantis. Thank you. Thank you. Benedict Arnold was a true supporter of the American Revolution and had clearly demonstrated his abilities and bravery on the battlefield. He and General George Washington shared many traits, experiences, and challenges. For Arnold, the twice-wounded victor at Fort Ticonderoga and the Battle of Saratoga, what drove him to treachery? And how did Washington rise above his enemies, both in Congress and on the battlefield, while Arnold became embittered by his critics? George Washington and Benedict Arnold, A Tale of Two Patriots, is a story that few Americans know and unveils a part of our history that we should all know and understand. This program is being webcast live from the library website at pritzkermilitarylibrary.org and will be archived on our site as part of the permanent collection. About halfway through, we will start to take questions from our studio audience and from those of you joining us via the Internet. Our thanks to the McCormick Tribune Foundation, Turtle Wax, our individual season sponsors, and our associate members for making this program possible. David R. Palmer is a retired Lieutenant General of the United States Army, a two-tour veteran of Vietnam, former superintendent at West Point, and an accomplished military historian specializing in the campaigns of George Washington and the 18th century American Army. He often appears as a commentator on television documentaries on the Revolutionary War and is the author of many books, including The Way of the Fox, American Strategy in War for America, 1775 to 1738, and George Washington, First in War. A graduate of West Point and Duke University, Palmer lives with his wife in Belton, Texas. He joins us tonight to discuss his book, George Washington and Benedict Arnold, A Tale of Two Patriots. Please join me in welcoming to the Pritzker Military Library, Dave Palmer. General. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And let me say at the outset that to be with you here tonight... I'm thrilled. Now, let's go to the book itself. Someone was telling me earlier tonight he had been to Saratoga, the battlefield where uh, the American army defeated the British in October of 1777, way in upper state New York, conquered, broke the British lines, won the battle, captured the entire army. And this is 1777. Did I say 79? 1777. And that brought the French into the war, and that allowed us eventually to win the war. And there's a spot there where Benedict Arnold was wounded. He won the battle almost single-handedly by his uh, bravery and his courage and his sheer leadership. And he was severely wounded. A musket ball shattered his left thigh at that moment, three years into the revolution. At that moment... If that musket ball had penetrated his heart, not his leg, Benedict Arnold would be one of the greatest heroes in the lexicon of American heroes. There'd be a state name for him. There'd be statues in the, in the rotunda of the Capitol. Every state would have a county and a city named for Arnold. People with the last name of Arnold would rush to name their boys Benedict proudly. Instead... He went on to be a man without a country. Now, I'm going to talk about the two patriots very quickly, and I'm not going to uh, tell you all the details in the book because I do want you to go buy it. These two men, George Washington and Benedict Arnold, were contemporaries, 
and their, their parallelisms in their backgrounds, in their life, in their experiences are almost too eerie to be real. Both were born into colonial America, into, in Virginia and Washington's case, Connecticut and Arnold's case, into very well-to-do families, very influential families, and both anticipated, their parents anticipated when they were born, that the two boys would have a life that would be in the upper crust of society. Arnold was on his way to go to Yale. That's where he'd be educated. Washington, like his father and his two older half-brothers, would go back to England to school. Both boys, though, had their plans turned upside down. Washington's father died suddenly when he was 11 years old, when Washington was 11 years old. Arnold's father didn't die, but about that same age, when the boy was the same age, he became a hopeless alcoholic. And in that day and age, alcoholism was a death sentence. So both boys lived uh, without a father. Neither mother remarried, which was strange in that day and age. Women almost, men, or women almost always remarried because it took two to run a family, to run a farm, to do a business. But neither did. So both were raised by a single mom. Both saw their family fortune and their family reputation dissipated. Both had to learn a trade to make their way in the world. Both were eminently successful, self-made men. When the revolution came along, each was the, if not the wealthiest, one of the wealthiest men in the colony. They were influential. And then in the, in the fighting, it turned out both were terrific, natural, gifted battlefield leaders. And in the first three years of the revolution, 1775, 17. 76, 1777, they were the two who carried the war. They were the two celebrities in the war. If you pull either one out of the equation, it is impossible to see the American Revolutionary War ending up the way it ended. The British thought Arnold was the best battlefield commander on either side. So did the Americans, and he was. He was Washington's go-to man, the man that Washington sent when he needed someone to go far from headquarters, far from his immediate supervision, lead an independent command, and do the right things to win victory on the battlefield. Similar uh, to World War II, uh, Dwight Eisenhower in Europe, Washington, and George Patton, Arnold. Patton was... Washington uh, was uh, Eisenhower's warrior, much as Arnold was George Washington's. Arnold admired and respected Washington. Washington obviously reciprocated and gave this man the toughest jobs that he had. Both were courageous to a fault. By the odds, neither one should have expected to have lived through the war. They both led from the front. They had horses shot from under them. They had bullets through their clothes. Washington was never scratched. Arnold was seriously wounded twice, but they should have, shouldn't, in that day and age, have expected to survive uh, a long war. In the first three years, the things that were done militarily on the American side, on the Patriot side, those things were done by Washington or by Arnold. They never fought in, in, a, in a battle together, interestingly enough because Washington always had Arnold off on detached duty. They served together and they knew each other, but they never were uh, tied together in a battle. And I won't go into all the battles. You can, you can get the, uh, the book and you can, you can read that. Uh, Arnold was, uh, had a reputation, battlefield reputation, that uh, far transcended that of any other man. Americans took to calling him the American Hannibal, after Hannibal, uh, the man who kept Rome tied in knots for years and years and years. A terrific warrior. Now, during those years also, while they had great, they had successes, uh, victories, uh, they gained a great reputation, they both suffered enemies, severe uh, cabals against the two. 
Men in Congress, politicians, wanted to get rid of both of them, treated them both shamelessly. Um, the, uh, shamefully. The, uh, uh, they both uh, suffered criticism. We don't think about Washington nowadays as uh, having almost been kicked out of office, almost having been relieved as the commander-in-chief. There was a great movement to do that. There were other generals, jealous generals, jealous of their reputation, who thought they could do a better job than either. Uh, Arnold and Washington suffered tremendously in, in a little bit different ways because their status was a little different. Arnold was a very wealthy man when the war started. He used his own money uh, often to supply his troops, to provide ammunition, to provide food, equipment, uh, cannon, and so forth, and uh, became uh, a man who really uh, lost his fortune. Washington was a little shrewder. He uh, didn't accept a uh, salary, but just said to the Congress, I will just work without a salary. You pay my expenses. Well, if any of you have ever been on business trips, you know what that can run into. Uh, so he, was, uh, he, he wasn't hurting the way Arnold was for money. But both had criticism. So here are these two people. Now, their lives as young men, their lives as children, their lives as uh, young warriors, as leaders in the revolution, both the pluses and the minuses, very similar. Now, the personalities weren't, weren't, uh, weren't similar. And yet, with all of that, and being the two greatest warriors, the men who kept the revolution going in the first three years, one ended up the father of our country, and the other ends up a man without a country. And the obvious question is, why? What happened? Well, Arnold, under that pressure, and Washington, under that pressure, reacted to it differently. Washington kept his eye on the goal of winning the war. He stayed above petty political bickering. Arnold, on the other hand, let it eat at him. And as it got bad, he crumbled. And he finally became a traitor. He became the man whose very name is synonymous with treason. Why? What happened? Well, I'll, I'll get to uh, an examination of his personality a little later, but he went through about three phases from being the supreme patriot to being the absolute traitor uh, to the cause. Uh, he, it's, it's probably true, I think it is true, that any time a man, and I, and I want to say a man because I'm not sure about women, uh, we haven't had experience enough with enough women being in enough high positions who've uh, uh, run afoul of the law or something to really know, but for men, for sure, when men in high positions fall from grace and end up in jail or something, it's always for one of three reasons, or maybe two reasons of the three, or all three. In Arnold's case, it was all three. One is money, one is power, and one is sex. And Arnold was caught on all three. Now, I can see from heads nodding, I just sold three or four books right there. <laughs> Arnold, when he was wounded at Saratoga, had to... Uh, actually, he should not have lived. Given the state of medicine at that time, his, his uh, thigh, was, thigh bone was smashed. He lived the rest of his life uh, with the leg very short. Uh, when his horse, and the horse was killed in that volley, reared and fell on him, it twisted and ground the leg again. And the doctor said, the only way to save your life is to amputate. And he said, no, I will... I will live, able to walk, or I'll, I'll die, but I will not be a cripple. Uh, they shrugged their shoulders, put him flat on his back for two months, encased his leg in a wooden box, uh, the equivalent in the 18th century of a cast, and he couldn't move. For two months, he had to lie there in terrible pain with his leg putrefying, and they lanced it, and uh, let's don't after supper get into all the details, but he... Uh, he did survive. But in that time of convalescence, 
He had time to think. Now, he's a man of action. And it's dangerous when you let a man of action think. But he, he had time to reflect over how he had been treated. How he had been treated by Congress. How they wouldn't refund his money uh, that he had spent for the common good. How they refused to promote him and promoted uh, people who were far uh, junior to him in rank and junior to him in deeds. And on and on. And he decided, at that point, money comes in. He's going to use, when he recovers, his rank and his, his authority to make money, to restore his fortune. And he sets out to do that. Again, I'm not, I can't get into all the details, but once you set out on that path where money becomes your goal, you're on a slippery slope. You start doing unethical things, and then pretty soon you're doing illegal things, and that was what he got caught up in. And as he got caught up more and more in that, he began to be in conflict more and more with political leaders. So he becomes obsessed with restoring his reputation, his power, and and staying in power, getting in power, getting positions of authority. Then he starts, he becomes enamored with an 18-year-old loyalist girl. He's 30. Uh, six years old. His first wife had died in the first year of the war. Uh, he f- met Peggy Shippen, Margaret Peggy Shippen, in Philadelphia. She had been, when the British had occupied the city, and Arnold is now the military commander of it, uh, she had dated British officers. Uh, they court, and they marry, and within two weeks of the marriage, he has sent his first traitorous message to the British. How did he do that? Through Peggy. She had dated the man who was the aide to camp to the British commander. So she knew how to send what would appear to be an innocent letter to this British officer in New York City. Uh, Peggy was a complete co-conspirator of his. Uh, That wasn't known until the 1930s when someone digging through the musty old files in London found the documents that said she was a complicit traitor as well. The king had given her a lifetime pension as well as Arnold. See, back in, And she got away with it. Back in the 1700s, unlike today, today we know that women are very capable of horrendous acts. But back in the 1700s, they didn't think that ladies, particularly a young mother, could possibly be traitorous. But she was. And she egged him on and, and helped push him over the edge. Now, I wish I had time to tell you the story of how he almost didn't get away with his... He didn't get away with it. He got caught, but he personally got away. Uh, it, it is right out of Hollywood. George Washington uh, is riding to visit him at, uh, at his headquarters. He's a half hour away when a rider comes in with a message saying that uh, the game is up. Uh, his, his go-between with the British has been captured. He's got documents in his boots signed by Arnold. And it's known that Arnold is a traitor. He gets in his boat, rows down the river, has his eight soldiers row him down, then he puts them into captivity um, and gets away just by an eyelash. Hollywood couldn't have done it any better. Washington attempts to capture him, uh, is unsuccessful. He did get away. Uh, Washington uh, said, we'll never use the name of Benedict Arnold again. He did try... Uh, uh, later a couple of times to get his hands on him by one time sending in a spy, by another time sending Lafayette with a force of troops to try to ambush him. And his orders were, if you get your hands on him, execute him summarily. Uh, The Continental Congress decreed that the name of Benedict Arnold will be erased from the register. So that's the story. And that's the story I told those 14-year-old boys, and that's a story that's in the book. What's the legacy of these two people? The next to last chapter in the book is called just Legacy, and it's very short. Well, you know Washington's legacy. Everyone knows that. No man is as honored, and rightly so, in our history as George Washington. He's on the dollar bill. Our capital is named for him. There's a state named for him. I think every state in the Union has a county or a city named Washington. Uh, There are portraits of him. Uh, more and prints, more than you could look at if you live to be a hundred. There are more books than one man can read in a lifetime. Uh, he is the most honored man in America, first in war, first in peace, first in 
the hearts of his countrymen. That's his legacy. Arnold's? The two places in America where he is, he is honored. The Saratoga battlefield that I mentioned earlier. Put yourself in the shoes now of the poor old park ranger some decades ago who's told to arrange this battlefield so our citizens can come walk through it and see what happened. This is the key battle in the American Revolution. Yorktown concluded it, but this one made the conclusion possible. And Arnold is the man that made the battle victory possible. And there's probably in all of the United States no piece of ground more hallowed than that spot where Arnold personally broke the lines, wasn't the British lines, Hessian lines, but in the British forces, and fell wounded but caused the battle to succeed. And if you're that park ranger, you can't talk about the battle and not talk about that. Yet, you can't use the man's name, you can't mention him. So if you go up to uh, Saratoga, and I know at least one person in this audience has been there, you'll find a little 10 foot by 10 foot wrought iron enclosure. And inside that enclosure is the strangest monument in America. It is, uh, it's, it's stone. I don't know if it's marble or granite. It's boss relief. And when you look at it, it's just a leg. A leg. A left leg in a military boot. No body. Just a leg all by itself. You see the symbolism. That was, he was shot in that leg where he broke the lines, bled for America at that point. No name. No person. No statue. Then there's a plaque, and the plaque says, and I'm paraphrasing, on this spot, on such and such a day, an American hero caused the Battle of Saratoga to be won, and so forth and so on. That's where he's honored there. The second, and the, there are only two, is at West Point. I didn't tell you that West Point was, the, the fortress of West Point was what Arnold was going to sell to the British. The British believed if they got West Point, they'd win the war. The Americans believed if the British got control of that fortification, the British would win the war. Arnold, having decided to go to the other side, didn't just turn his coat and become a British officer. He made a deal. First, he was going to change sides. Secondly, they were going to pay him well for it. He was a businessman. And they agreed 20,000 pounds, a lot of money, a lot of money at that time. And, and he would bring the revolution down when he changed sides. He wasn't just going to the other side. He was going to defeat the revolution. That's what made his treason so horrible. And to do that, he got himself appointed as the commander of the fortifications of West Point. And that's what he was going to sell to the British. So if you go to West Point, that has nothing to do with that. Just, that's just an aside. Go to the cemetery, go in the gate, and you'll see ahead of you the cadet chapel built in the early 1800s, a small little building. Go in the door, and down the aisle you face the altar. On the right side, running from the front all the way to the back up under the choir loft, are, is a, high up on the wall near the ceiling is a row of plaques. They're all identical, save one. They're about this big shiny, black, and they each have four entries only, very plain. A name, Nathaniel Green. A rank, Major General. A date of birth and a date of death. That's all. And they start with Washington, who was the, the only, uh, all the rest were brigadiers or major generals. He was just the commanding general. His is first. Then they march down that wall, all the generals of the revolution, until you get to the last one, and that's Benedict Arnold's. It looks like all the others, has a rank, major general, has no name, has a date of birth, no date of death. And the symbolism is pretty clear. Traitors don't exist. They have no name. Traitors don't die, they just go away. So, those are the two places. That's his legacy. Now, why such, for two men who were so similar in so many ways, what would cause one to go down this path and the other to go down that path? 
And the answer is, one had tremendous strength of character and the other did not have strength of character. Simple, isn't it? Obvious. Well, if you're talking as I am right now, you can kind of hum and haw and and get around things. But if you're writing, you can't just say that. What does that mean? Strength of character. What does character mean? Go to a dictionary. Pick any dictionary you want, the biggest one you can find. I believe that character is that word in our language that has more shades of meaning than any other. Character means many things. The characters that you use to print something with. My wife is always saying I'm, I'm uh, the biggest character she knows. Uh, and it's always used with a modifier, the way we're talking about it, though. You don't just have character, you have good character. You have bad character, you have weak character, you have strong character. Human beings have been trying to define character since the ancient Greeks 3,000 years ago. And they're still at it, and they still never really come up with a good definition of it. It's something inside of people. We know it exists. You can see it. You can see the result of it or the result of its absence. You can't see it, touch it, feel it. It's intangible. But we all have it. Every one of us in this room has character inside of us. But what is it? Well, being an old soldier and having to put a definition in the book, I just did what old soldiers do. I kept it as simple as I possibly could. And character is something, that intangible something in each of us, that has two components. A component on one hand of knowledge, knowing the difference between right and wrong. How do you get that? Well, you get it from your family. You get it from your school. You get it in your Boy Scout troop. You get it in your soccer team. You get it in your uh, uh, church. You get it all your life. It continues to grow. Then the second component is action. Having the moral courage to act on What you know, the difference between right and wrong. Being sure that you will take the harder right instead of the easier wrong, even to the detriment of your own welfare and your own well-being or your own career or your own fortune. Always the person who has great strength of character will do what is right, even if it's the hard way to go. Washington had it. Arnold didn't. Washington was a servant of the country. Arnold was ego-centered. That's the difference. The final three words in the book are character is destiny. The destiny of Washington sprang from his character. The destiny of Arnold sprang from his character. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. I'm now ready to switch to your questions. Uh, Two questions. One, uh, what is your appraisal of Horatio Gates, who also was at the Battle of Saratoga? And then secondly, if you could just briefly explain why losing Fortress West Point was so crucial to the American campaign during the Revolution. Both very good questions. Horatio Gates was uh, uh, Arnold's commander uh, in in the northern region at the Battle of Saratoga. Gates was a highly overrated, uh, very insecure, very incompetent general. Uh, He had uh, become an enemy of Arnold's because he was jealous of Arnold. And this had been going on for uh, the better part of uh, almost two years. Uh, Arnold did what he did in spite of Gates. In fact, Gates had ordered him not to go to the battlefield. He went anyway. Uh, When Gates reported on the battle... He said, uh, he, he mentioned that Arnold was there. He could not mention it because he was wounded. But he didn't give him credit. He gave himself. In his dispatches back, Gates took all the credit. Uh, that also ate at Arnold while he's wounded. And Congress gives Gates a golden medal. And he knows that Gates, did, Gates wasn't even on the battlefield. And he knows he didn't deserve it. Why was West Point important? Think about the geography of the country at the time. It's not the United States we know now. It's 13 colonies, every one on the seaboard. The 3 million people living in America 
lived within almost a rifle shot of the of the water, uh, either a river leading to the water or the coast itself. They were they were right along the coast. There were no bridges. Half of the people lived east of the Hudson River in New England. Half of the population of America lived on the other side of it. The food was grown on one side, meat on the other, and so forth. If the British could... And and the Hudson River goes straight north from New York City to Albany and up toward Lake Ticonderoga. uh, And it's navigable all the way by ocean-going vehicles, by a fleet in that day and age. Still is. It's still Albany's a, a trading port for ocean-going ships. If the British could hold Albany and New York, with their fleet, they could keep control of the Hudson River. The Americans had no fleet. There was only one place in the entire stretch of the Hudson River where the Americans could control it, and that's right where West Point sits today, where the mountains, a string of very precipitous, steep, high, rugged mountains run east-west across the river. The river was very narrow, made an S-shaped turn, very deep. A cannon could shoot completely across it easily. Uh, And sailing ships couldn't negotiate it unless the wind just happened to be perfect. When a warship would come up, they'd have to lose way, get out in in, uh, long boats, and row their way around it. So if the Americans did, and they did, put fortifications with artillery on both sides right there, then no ship could pass, plus obstacles across the water. Then the Navy couldn't go north and south. And the mountains are so rugged that in the state of uh, the art of war at that time, ground forces couldn't have come in and taken them from the back. It was considered to be the Gibraltar of America. If any place was impregnable, That was it. The only way the British could see to get it was to buy it through Benedict Arnold. Good questions, Bo. Um, Hi, I'd like to ask you a perhaps impossible question, which is uh, I wonder if you would speculate about something. Um, Knowledge is no prerequisite to talk here, so... (laughs) All right, (laughs) good. (laughs) Um, You've made an almost sympathetic portrait of, of Arnold in your talk, and you've described about how his background in Washington's were similar. Uh, it sounds like they were both enormously ambitious men, both of them with maybe a similar sense of entitlement, um, but they had this difference in character. I'm wondering if the roles had been reversed and it had been Washington who'd found himself with his career on the wane unjustly and financial circumstances terrible, um, what do you think he would have done differently? Well, uh, you can all, I, can, I can almost answer that. I don't have to speculate too much. Uh, we don't know, of course, because you don't know what would have happened when it's a hypothetical question when it didn't happen. But we know enough about Washington at that time in his life and at other times to know that in all likelihood he would have said, well, okay, if you don't want me as your commander, I will go home and run the Virginia militia. Uh, he, uh, he was not enamored himself with power. He was ambitious. He uh, uh, did want to, and he was concerned about his legacy, but not to the point that he would have undermined the revolution, not to the point that he would have turned against it. He might have even uh, uh, gone into battle again as a subordinate uh, to someone else. He was never insubordinate ever to Congress. Uh, he, He established personally during the war and after in the writing of the Constitution, the, uh, the facet that makes America different from so many countries, and that is that the civilian authority in our country is always superior to the military authority. Washington set that as a priority. So he would have been aggravated. He was, he was uh, tried many times, but he always stayed loyal to the Congress. He always uh, kept his head uh, on the goal and and stayed uh, uh, honest to himself and honest to the cause. In General Palmer, we have a first question from the Internet. Uh, this individual wanted to come, but it's going to listen on podcast after it's uh, posted. In your opinion, how significantly different is the British view and resultant histiography in regard to Benedict Arnold? In the second part, how would you compare it to Earl Cornwallis 
uh, and uh, Lieutenant General Sir Henry Clinton. Uh, okay. Uh, th- th- Slight th- question. Th- yes, uh, the, the last two parts uh, would take a lot longer than we have. Uh, the way the British looked at Arnold uh, is interesting. Uh, they made him a brigadier general in their army. Uh, when he got away to them, they, they kept their bargain. Uh, he led troops, British and uh, German and loyalist American troops, against Americans both in Virginia and in Connecticut. Uh, he was the one who chased uh, Thomas Jefferson out of Richmond, the capital, and back into the mountains. Then he went to England uh, toward the war's end, and the war ended while he was there. He was well-received initially. The king uh, brought him in and had a meeting with him. Other people sought his advice about the war and about Americans. Uh, But they didn't like him. No one likes a traitor, even if he's your traitor. And he lived another 22 years after that treason. Uh, they They wouldn't continue his, when the war was over, continue his rank as a brigadier. He tried his hand at several businesses. He fought another duel. He fought duels often throughout his uh, life, never lost one. Uh, most people would not even fight him. He was, uh, he was so good at dueling. Uh, he died a broken, embittered, indebted man. His, his uh, remains and his wife's remains are buried in a little church in London, not in a grave that's marked, but just in a mass grave with a lot of other bodies and remains all mingled and mixed up there. The British uh, didn't like him. Uh, they respected his ability, but they didn't like him. Uh, he was really not a very personally likable individual. Uh, he was an in-your-face, the kind of guy you either thought was great or you thought was terrible. Uh, his, I'm talking about his personality now. Uh, in terms of Cornwallis and Clinton, um, They operated at a different level, particularly Clinton, uh, in the British Army. Uh, Arnold was clearly a better battlefield commander than either of them, than than any general, any other general on either side in the Revolution, for that matter. He was better in the midst of battle as a warrior. Uh, He didn't operate at the strategic level, though, that Clinton did, as he was more a contemporary of Washington's. So it would be very hard to compare uh, the two. It would be apples and oranges, in a way. George Washington's introduction into uh, military life, as well as being tempered, was during the French and Indian War, especially the Pittsburgh campaign. What was uh, Benedict Arnold's uh, introduction, and who was his mentors that developed this uh, great uh, military mind that led to the Revolutionary War? Uh, yes, uh, George Washington, at the age, at the ripe old age of 21, was a major uh, in the, and then a colonel in the Virginia militia. And his first uh, introduction to battle was leading troops against French troops out in the area, uh, in and around and toward Pittsburgh, where he first uh, cut his teeth. And then for about uh, another seven or eight years, he was the leader of the militia in the state of Virginia. Arnold's only pre-revolution, he was, he was uh, nine years younger than Washington, and his only pre-war experience was being a militiaman, and they were mustered once in the French and Indian War, didn't get into battle, uh, marched off toward Ticonderoga, but it was over before they got there. When it was clear that war was coming, everyone in all the 13 colonies in the fall of 1774, spring of 1775, began to prepare militia units. And Arnold and a group of of other uh, uh, like-minded men in the town of Norwich, Connecticut, formed a militia company. Arnold had money, and he he probably bought most of the uniforms that they had and so forth. They elected him as their captain. So he starts off uh, right after the British uh, uh, start the war up at Lexington and Concord outside of Boston. Uh, The word gets to Norwich, Connecticut a couple of days later. Arnold... Uh, rallies his company and marches off to Boston to go to war. He has had no experience. He uh, is self-taught, if if you will. What he does is instinctive and natural. His natural bent was attack, never defend, audacity, be aggressive. And in in the absence of uh, uh, anything else, that worked. 
Do you believe uh, that there was something else in Arnold's early life in Norwich, Connecticut, where I believe he was from, uh, in his family situation rather than simply, uh, you know, uh, the tradition he was raised in? And also, uh, that, I mean, that caused his problem. And I was just kind of curious, whatever happened with, I believe, his, the alias of his contact, uh, American name was Anderson, wasn't it? The fellow he gave the secrets to. It, it, uh, I, let me answer that quickly. And, uh, uh, and I just want to ask, well, what were the charges in Philadelphia for corruption? Oh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I misunderstood He's had a court-martial problem in Philadelphia over corruption yeah. of his regime. Yeah, he was court-martialed and found uh, guilty on, on two counts, two minor counts. There were nine altogether that were lodged. Most were frivolous uh, because of the political atmosphere. And his sentence was to be reprimanded by Washington, a slap on the wrist. Uh, that was, uh, but that was a part that fit in a whole pattern of, of what he conceived to be terrific slights toward him. Um, the man, Andre, who was caught, who was his go-between, was hanged as a spy. Uh, he was, uh, that's what happened to spies in that day and age. They were hanged and he, uh, he was strung up by the neck. Um, and there was another part to your question. Early oh, early, yes, yes. I, I'm not a psychologist, but um, when he was, he was the eldest child uh, in the family. And he was uh, slated to go off. He was being sent to prep school to later go to the university. And when he was 11 or 12, his father goes from being the most, uh, the, inf- most uh, the, the leading citizen in the town to being the town drunk. And Arnold suffers under that. Uh, his father, uh, it had been better if his father just died like Washington's did, but he had to suffer with a drunken father. And the mother had to try to run the business. And she made ends meet only by getting handouts from relatives. So Arnold was uh, uh, mortified by all of this. He, was, he had to be apprenticed to uh, some family members who ran a, a pharmacy in the town and to learn the trade. When you're an apprentice, you work for seven years for room and board, and they, they take care of you and educate you, but you have to, you're, you're, you're basically uh, a servant until you reach 21. And he left Norwich as soon as he could, went to New Haven and uh, settled his business there. And, and I, I think just from his, his adult personality, he was always, always had a chip on his shoulder. He would not take a slight, uh, whereas uh, someone, would, would, someone would say something bad about Washington. He'd just let it go over his head. They said something bad about Arnold. He wanted to fight. He'd say, here's a dagger, a sword, or a pistol. Pick your weapon. And would, mo- most of them would. So I think, and again, I'm not a psychologist, but I think he carried all of his life uh, a sense of, I can't, I can't ex- describe it better than he just uh, had an attitude. Uh, with a chip on his shoulder, he was always uh, ready to take offense easily. Honor to him, the word honor, uh, he used it a lot, and he fought duels to, to salve his honor. But it's very clear in his writings and his statements, to him, honor meant reputation. My reputation has been bruised, whereas honor to most people meant something much deeper than reputation. Hi. I actually have a follow-up question about uh, Major Andre. Um, growing up, uh, my family always told me that my family helped capture Major Andre, but I always heard different versions of what exactly happened. So I was wondering if you could say sure, the sure. story. And if, you, if, you're, uh, if your forebears go back to uh, uh, one of three guys that lived in uh, the period, uh, the area between uh, West Point and New York on the east coast of the Hudson River, then they may be right. Uh, Andre, the, the, the British were ready to strike. They had the ships. They had the troops. They were just waiting for the last piece of the puzzle to be put in place. And that was an emissary from the British commander to go talk personally to Arnold about the details of the plan, how they would do it. Uh, it was very difficult. You know, they didn't have blackberries and uh, so forth at that time, uh, email. They had to write things down and encode. It was very difficult to pass messages back and forth. So they, they decided there had to be a face-to-face meeting 
just before West Point is attacked. And Andre was the man who was sent up to be the go-between. He met with Arnold at night on the banks of the Hudson, and by just happenstance, uh, the British ship that brought him up was sitting out there at anchor, and Americans who had no idea what was going on got tired of seeing it, so they hustled a little cannon out and started firing at it. And the captain of the ship had to cut at the anchor and, and row down. He, they caught him at slack tide and no wind, and they, they did it on purpose. So he had to row the boat out of the way. So Andre is left now inside American lines on shore. He puts the, the documents in his boot, puts on civilian clothes, and is led on horseback across the river with, a, with an American escort and a pass signed by Arnold, the commander of the region. And he's riding down the east side of the river. He's almost to British lines. Now, see, he thinks he's pretty safe. If he's caught and Americans catch him, he's got this pass signed by Arnold. If he's caught and it's British who capture him, he, I'm a British officer, take me to the, your headquarters. Uh, so he's okay. But these three American militiamen see him coming down. They stop him uh, and ask him what he's doing. He thinks they're British. So he tips off that he's a British officer. Well, that's a little suspicious to them because they're Americans. So they strip him. And, uh, well, you know, he might have a watch on him or something. And they find those uh, uh, documents in his boots and think, wow, we've got something strange here. So uh, they keep the watch if they found it. But they, uh, they give the documents and Andre to their commander, who's not the, he's not the sharpest arrow, in the longest arrow in the quiver. This guy's not, does, he, he's a good soldier, but he's not bright. And he doesn't know what to do. Here it looks like this guy is, uh, that his boss, Arnold, is a traitor. On the other hand, that's his boss, his commander. How could the most famous warrior in the American army be a, be a traitor? So he decides to take two actions. He sends the documents to Washington, and he sends Andre with an escort to Arnold's headquarters. <laughs> so... At any rate, uh, and, and the story gets more complex, but that's how he's caught. Uh, General, without uh, putting you in the headlines or anything, would you care to talk about character in today's political and military world without getting into individuals or just in general? Well, uh, in, in today's military world, let me, let me back off just a little uh, to avoid... Uh, serving officers, you know, us us old retired guys should be should be very reticent to talk about active duty folks. They're doing so much better job than we ever could have anyway that I wouldn't dare. Um, I I uh, some of you who served might have known a guy named Jack Vesey. Uh, Jack Vesey was ended up chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, Jack Vesey entered uh, World War II as a National Guard sergeant out of the state of Minnesota, and I got to know him when we served in a division together. Uh, I was a battalion commander, and, and he was the division chief of staff. Vesey went on to, uh, uh, to make general officer. He was uh, uh, in the Pentagon, was uh, a, a high-ranking staff officer, had working for him a man whose name doesn't make, it, make any difference, Shymeyer, uh, an, another military man, as his deputy. Vesey gets his fourth star and is sent to Korea as the commander over there. And he's the commander over there. A uh, very successful, very competent, very loved officer. Uh, Carter is the president, and he decides he's going to pull American forces out of Korea. You may remember that. And if, if that was going on, that discussion. And at that point, the Army needed a new chief of staff, the top general in the American Army. And Vesey was one of those considered. And Carter, President Carter uh, called him back from Korea, interviewed him in the Oval Office, and told him he was thinking about making him the chief of staff. And General Vesey, now you've got to remember, this is the, the epitome. If you're an army officer, a lifelong career army officer, this is about as high as it gets. This is, this is the top of what you aspire to be. And Vesey looked him in the eye and said, Mr. President, I'm honored, but at the testimony, at the, uh, when, when I have to go before Congress, uh, and if they ask me about your policy in Korea, I'll have to tell them I don't agree with it. 
I think you're wrong. I think pulling our troops out of Korea now is not the thing to do. He was very straight with him. And Carter said, well, thank you very much. And sent him back to Korea and appointed someone else. Uh, in fact, he appointed this guy who was his deputy, Shai Meyer. Well, Shai Meyer, uh, knowing what a good man uh, uh, Vesey was, brought him back when it was time to leave Korea and made him the vice, the second in command in the army, if you will. And he's in that job when a new president is looking for a chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the highest military position in America. And word of Vesey's integrity and honesty got to him. He says, that's the man I want. So that's how Vesey got to be the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Character. Ladies and gentlemen, Dave Palmer. Thank you very much. We'll come back in a second. Our very special thanks to Dave Palmer. His book is George Washington and Benedict Arnold, A Tale of Two Patriots, published by Regnery Publishing. You can learn more about our library, view this program in its entirety, or download our audio podcast by visiting us at PritzkerMilitaryLibrary.org. For all the staff at the Pritzker Military Library in Chicago, I'm Ryan Yantis. Thanks, and be safe. And welcome back to the rest of tonight's question and answers. I know there are more questions out there. Again, Dave Palmer, sir. We're now on the podcast or the webcast part of it. So please continue your questions. Coming. Well, I'm, I'm sorry. I shouldn't be pointing. They, they need to give you the mic. If I could follow up on the uh, question regarding uh, General Gates, uh, and I know this is a slight digression from your book, uh, but General Gates seems to have been uh, very successful in taking over the Northern District Command uh, from General Schuyler to fight the Battle of Saratoga in the first place. Uh, ran from the battlefield subsequent to that in the South, an action for which it seems to me he should have been court-martialed for. But my, my question, uh, and was very passive at Saratoga and did not seem to even want to engage General Burgoyne. Uh, but my question is, uh, what, was, what, was the, what was the political forces behind General Gates that he, he seemed after the time of Saratoga, I mean, he uh, attempted to uh, in, engage in a number of coups against General Washington, uh, one of which was almost successful. Uh, what was the political power behind General Gates that allowed him to continue to lead all of these lives in distinction despite his uh, ineptness as a commander? Uh, well, he, he was a good administrator. He was a good administrative officer, uh, not at all a battlefield leader. In fact, he was cowardly. Uh, and, if, <laughs> and that's a, that's a, a you, you can't be a coward and lead in battle. Uh, he remember this. These were not thirteen united colonies; these were thirteen individual, separate colonies, united a little bit in a common cause at one time. The New England states and the state of New York and some others were politically, uh, not military, politically at odds through most of the war. Their representation in Congress was at odds. Uh, Gates had the backing of the New England political leaders. Uh, John Adams and others uh, thought Gates was uh, just first rate. Uh, New York, Schuyler was a New Yorker, and others uh, knew that he wasn't uh, uh, very good. But Congress, in, in its infinite wisdom, every once in a while, dipped down into the Continental Army and made decisions that should have been left to Washington. And uh, assigning generals was one of them. And that's how Gates got assigned to some of those jobs. Um, you said that, uh, okay, Arnold was going, to was going to give West Point to the British. Uh, how was this going to be done? I mean, the commanding general can't just walk out and tell everybody, I think we should surrender now. They're all going to go look at it. It was like, What? <laughs> Yeah. There had to be some plot there. Did he have, uh, was the, there the, any accomplices the, of what? Uh, did Arnold have anybody associated with him in his plot, or was he just going to pull it off all by himself? Sure. Uh, no one knows. Uh, Arnold and Andre talked it over that night. He gave Andre the plans 
where all the cannons were, where the troops were, uh, how you got in, where you could land a ship, uh, all of that uh, information. But in their personal, they spent the night talking, and they obviously that's what they talked about. Andre was hanged uh, very shortly thereafter, and Arnold, uh, if he ever wrote anything about it, it's not survived. Uh, but the way it would have happened, and he also did a lot during his few months in command, very few, just a couple, uh, did things to weaken the garrison, sent troops off on detached uh, work and so forth. The garrison was in really, the defenses were in bad shape, and the garrison of soldiers was in bad shape. And all I can say is, and I've asked myself that very question, and all I can say is, well, the British would have known where to go. They would have known what the pressure points were. And Arnold would have been able to have given commands that would have uh, eviscerated the unity and the integrity of the, of the American defenses. Uh, so the British would have been able to come in and take it. He might have even planned in, in certain instances, certain little forts, uh, or certain, not little forts, but certain parts of the large fortification, he might have even uh, ordered them to march out and surrender. I have a two-part question, sir. One, was there any effort that you were able to find by Arnold uh, to reach back to Washington or the American government after he had fled to England? And the second is, what was the biggest surprise you found in researching this book about Arnold? Uh, there, there was no effort at all that uh, I've ever seen or heard or read of where Arnold attempted in any way to contact uh, anyone in America. His wife, whose family still did live in America, uh, did. She could contact her family, but she stayed in England uh, the rest of her life, too. The, uh, he knew that he was, uh, <laughs> to put it mildly, persona non gratis. He could not have come back to America, and he never tried. He did once, for a short period, come back to Canada and attempt to establish a business in uh, Nova Scotia, I believe it was. But, uh, but that was it. The major thing that I learned about Arnold that I had not known when I... I knew the story. I told it to those boys uh, way back when. Uh, but I, I did find that there were, when I started writing the book little holes, little gaps that I had to dig out. And one of them was exactly what went on in his mind from the time he was wounded in, at the Battle of Saratoga in October of 1777 until uh, the treason, which came about a year and a half later when he first reached out to the British. And I was able to uh, pin that down because of his writings and Peggy's writings and all the British records. Not everything. Obviously, you never know what goes on in a person's mind. But you can read what he said, when he said it, who he said it to, uh, what his... Uh, because his letters to the British, although they were in code, uh, were decoded in the British files. And he told them what he would do and what he wanted to do. And they told him what they wanted. So there was quite an exchange back and forth. And that's when uh, I realized that it was... Uh, that he went through those three pretty distinct steps uh, to, be, to uh, become a traitor. One, when he was just trying to vindicate his reputation. One, when he was trying to make money to restore his fortune. And the other, when he uh, had decided he was bent on revenge. He wanted vengeance. And you can see those, uh, that progression in time. That was the, the biggest uh, uh, element that popped in my mind. I read somewhere that uh, the Benedict Arnold's family owned Jamestown or part of Jamestown, Rhode Island. And when the Shippen family came to America originally, they became friends with Arnold's ancestors. And then somehow they migrated to Philadelphia. And, and uh, has there been any uh, research that shows how they might have gone back b besides just meeting socially in Philadelphia? Uh, there, there are descendants of Arnold still living in England. Uh, to my knowledge, there are none in America, and we're none. Benedict Arnold was really Benedict Arnold V. Uh, in his family, the tradition was naming Benedict Arnold, then Benedict Arnold II, Benedict Arnold the, uh, on down the line. His son was Benedict Arnold VI, but his son uh, died, uh, was killed in fighting the English against the French uh, in a later war. 
Uh, there are no descendants of Benedict Arnold alive in America. Uh, the very first Benedict Arnold, by the way, was governor, longtime governor of Rhode Island. And, oh, oh Jamestown, Rhode Island. Uh, yes, the Arnold family owned a lot of land, owned a lot of land in, in that uh, area. And the particular uh, various people in the family lost it. Benedict Arnold's father, uh, unfortunately, ended up leaving Rhode Island because his father was a spendthrift, not a businessman. They had lost uh, it all, I, and maybe they kept title to some. But he moved to Norwich, Connecticut, and started his business there. Uh, I'd, I there could be uh, there could be some piece of land because the Arnold family was in Rhode Island and Connecticut for so long that. Uh, stayed somehow uh, in the Arnold line. Maybe he's owned by the, by the Arnolds in England. Well, now the legend is that at one time the uh, Arnold family owned like a third of James Hudson Island. They, the, uh, they owned lots and lots of it. Yes, sir. General Arnold was definitely on the slippery slope by the time he had met Peggy Shippen. Had he never met her, do you see the end being any different? Uh, good question. Again, it's hypothetical. Who, who knows what would have happened if, if something that didn't happen happened. Um, I think it might have been. He was definitely on a, on a... But he had not made the decision to change sides. He had made the decision that he was going to restore his fortune. He was still going to work as an American, as a, a Continental Army Major General. He was still going to serve, although he was uh, uh, crippled with that short leg, uh, and he was going to restore his fortune. He was also going to get vindication. But things began, as he dated Peggy, in fact, the fact that she was a loyalist actually even even heated up uh, the ire of those who were against him, that he was being uh, a more a loyalist than a patriot. And so during their courtship, with her influence, and we'll never know uh, quite what that was, he makes that final transition to having decided, I'm going to get revenge. I'm going to go to the other side. And the fact that he, he, he wasn't thinking that way at all when he met her. He, he was, after two weeks after they married, he sent his first treasonous letter. So you fill in the dots in between, and I think she probably had a great deal to do with uh, him making the final decision. Yes, sir. Uh, we know there are no direct descendants of George Washington and no direct descendants of Thomas Jefferson, but did you say they're direct descendants of Benedict Arnold? Of Benedict Arnold in, uh, in England, yes. Yes. There's um, a man in Norwich, Connecticut, the, uh, Benedict's uh, hometown where he was born and grew up, who uh, st former state senator, uh, pretty well up in years now, but has devoted most of his life to studying the uh, Arnold family, and he found the descendants in England, uh, has gone to visit them several times, and I've gotten information from this man, who's a friend of mine, who, uh, uh, and he found out everything he could find out about the descendants of the family there, uh, took uh, at his own expense, in fact, put a, uh, a marker up on the wall that says somewhere in this mass grave is Benedict and Peggy Arnold. Yes, sir. If uh, memory serves me correctly, at the siege of Yorktown, uh, didn't uh, Benedict Arnold mount an operation in Connecticut or Rhode Island? And I don't know if, if, if you know if that was to take pressure off of that battle or was it done independently? Yes. Uh, Arnold, as I said, had uh, led forces against Americans twice. He led a campaign into Virginia and then was recalled by the British commander uh, because he put a more senior man in charge as the, as the force got larger down there. Uh, and when Washington and, and uh, Rochambeau, the commander of the French army, managed to uh, act like they were going to attack New York City and slip to the west and dash to Yorktown before the British could react, at that point, the British commander decided he would... Uh, attack uh, 
ammunition stores, uh, equipment stores in New London, Connecticut. And the, uh, that would cause Washington, he thought, he hoped, to have to leave some forces back to take care of that. It didn't work. Washington ignored it. But Arnold was given the command because New London is up the Thames River, the Thames River, they call it, I think, there in Connecticut, but T-H-A-M-E-S, uh, is only a few miles from Norwich. So Arnold knew the area very well. He was responsible for uh, the burning of the town of New London and a slaughter of Americans uh, in a fort across the river uh, at the same time. That was the last, the last act, uh, military act, that he uh, ever participated in. He went to England right after that. In general, I have a question. When you say that Arnold, from my experience, when an officer is stricken, it's almost as if they didn't exist. How, per, how deep were, were the records contemporary to his service affected? Was he excised in a 1984 fashion? And did uh, it make your research hard? Well, yes. The, the, what the Continental Congress said was his name will be erased from the register. And there was a complete wave of revulsion that swept America. Not just this guy had gone to the other side, but he was trying to torpedo the revolution as he did so. Uh, just going to the other side would have been bad enough. It would have been like uh, George Patton in, in the Battle of the Bulge saying, you know, this guy Hitler's got some things going. I think I'm going to become a Nazi. Uh, you know, it would have been incredible for us to imagine that. It was incredible at the time. Uh, you go, at, and the extent to which they went uh, is shown in the old colonial cemetery in uh, Norwich, where Benedict Arnold's father um, and mother and his three siblings who died uh, early are buried in a family plot. If you go there today and... Uh, his mother's headstone is there. There's a place there where his father should be, but there's no headstone. Uh, the first child born, by the way, uh, Arnold, I said, was the eldest. Actually, he had an older brother who died uh, a week or two after he was born. And so uh, he, he's buried as an infant. But that was Benedict Arnold V. They gave Benedict Arnold the same name. They wanted to carry the line along, Benedict Arnold V. But this little child uh, was Benedict Arnold. And then there's graves for the other uh, three siblings. There were four altogether that died. Um, you go there today, the mother's is there, and uh, the other two children, uh, the little boy named Benedict Arnold is gone, the headstone, and the headstone for the father named Benedict Arnold is gone. The, the town fathers in Norwich, Connecticut, took Congress literally, went out to the, uh, to the cemetery and removed the headstones that had Benedict Arnold written on them. That's pretty much conclusive. Ladies and gentlemen, Dave Palmer. <laughs> that does it for tonight. Our thanks to Dave Palmer for joining us and discussing George Washington and Benedict Arnold, A Tale of Two Patriots published by Regnery Publishing. You can learn more about this book, our program, and all it, our library has to offer at PritzkerMilitaryLibrary.org. For everyone here in Chicago, I'm Ryan Yantis. Thanks and be safe. Good night. The views and opinions expressed in this program are not necessarily those of the library. This program is made possible by our sponsors. 2006-2007 season sponsors, McCormick Tribune Foundation, Turtle Wax, Karen L. Pritzker and Michael K. Vallot, Robert and Myrie Pritzker, Albert and Audrey Ratner. And our program sponsors, Chicago Sun-Times, IBS Futures, David Truitt. To learn more, Visit our website at www.pritzkermilitarylibrary.org. This has been a production of the Pritzker Military Library. The proceeding was a production of the Pritzker Military Library. 
Events are webcast live from the library and can be viewed from our website. For more information about our webcasts, podcasts, or the library, visit our website at PritzkerMilitaryLibrary.org. The Pritzker Military Library. More than a library, it's an experience.